wanted to raise this topic, and even though we're going out to have only a short discussion, um, and the reason that I sent round just this, this it's no more than a paragraph or two of Heidegger um, to introduce it, is because I think this question of grounds is one that's emerging consistently in every single topic uh, uh, of our, the Foundation's research. But also because I think it's the thing that we see most absent or that people are most struggling in, uh, with um, in more general debate. You know, you, you see this certainly, the endless avalanche of what I would call middle-brow middle -brow research topics that are flooding um, the uh, uh, notice board lists of discipline after discipline, where you look at a topic and you think, well, what was the reason for raising that in the first place? What led you to think that that was worth? And then you look through the call for papers or you look through the description. And in fact, what you discover is it's presupposed that everybody who rocks up has already in some sense taken account of what the reason is that this question therefore need never be asked. And in fact, it's never asked because we don't know how to ask it. I found myself in the Heidegger and Classics reading group consistently reminding people that one of the most remarkable things that Heidegger does is he constantly asks us to ask in what order the things sit in order for them to, to be understood. In, in the Middle Ages, this was well understood, and it was often passed as the difference between the ordo ascendi, the order of being, and the ordo cognoscendi, the order of knowing. So that the order in which you come to know something is not necessarily the order in which something stands for itself. You get this most of all in Aristotle's description of number, where he shows that the first number that we encounter is the many, the manifold, and that we work out the two and then ultimately the one, although he further problematizes the one, from the many and the two. In other words, we proceed in, in a curious direction. But once we've learned that, we always know that every series of numbers begins at one and follows on up, one, two, three. But the acquiring of the knowing, the ordo cognoscendi, is in the first instance different from the order of ascendi, the, the order of how the num how number actually is in and of itself. And Aristotle makes, a, in fact, a number of Greeks make a very simple point that it is extremely difficult to describe one of anything because precisely the appearance of the genitive, the of, indicates the manifold before it indicates, so there's the order of knowing at work. It indicates the manifold, the of, this is one of a heap of apples. This is one of a bookcase of books. But when we come to describe the hen as such, and indeed Aaron and I have discovered this in rummaging through Heidegger's uh, discussions of hen, uh, uh, unity, singularity, because the paradox of describing something which is in itself unite, unitary, singular, requires not one, but in fact, an absolute manifold of languages to lead one into the one that is. In fact, Heidegger continually points us to the fact, but he's not doing something original. He's doing something that is well understood within the tradition, that in every case, to find our way into the ground requires taking a series of steps. So we could call that taking of the series of steps a taxis in Greek, an order, or rather an ordering. So that the first thing in any question of grounds is to find the order of the order. What orders? In what proper order does something stand in order for us to find our way back to the ground? The second problem in the question of grounds, however, is the where or the when. Where or when does the ground stand? 
Now, we could say that in the whole history of metaphysics, or certainly in the whole history of metaphysics in the recent era, that question has been easily resolved. We simply said, well, of course, God is the origin of all things. And therefore, we don't need to, uh, we don't need to inquire into this question in any way. Because precisely because God always stands at the origin of everything, the, uh, the question of how we reach that primacy is simply um, uh, decided. All we actually have to do is to clarify the ways in which it's decided. In other words, we lead people into what they already know, and we lead people into what is universally accepted. One of the most decisive things in the question of grounds, therefore, the, the, the most radical move I think that has been made in the modern era is the move not made, not the move made by Nietzsche. Nietzsche's is merely a dependency on this move, but on Kant, because Kant shows that it is the subjectivity of the subject that stands at the or as the origin of the ordering of order for the question of grounds in the modern uh, in the modern era. I don't have time to explain why that is. It is again the way the, the question that Heidegger raised in his discussions on Kant in the late 1920s when he places the transcendental imagination, the Einbildungskraft, as the transcendental unity of apperception, which stands at the basis of all knowledge, erkenntnis theory, epistemology, if you want to call it that. That most radical of moves is only clarified by Nietzsche, therefore, when Nietzsche declares God, God to be dead. In other words, all that Nietzsche is doing is declaring that it is now more or indeed most openly understood that we no longer take for granted that God is the ordering origin of, of ground. And that from now, and this doesn't, and even Nietzsche makes this clear, this does not make of us atheists. It's, sim it's simply a question of the order of thinking. For Kant certainly was not no atheist. And so the, the positing of the Einbildungskraft, the positing of the transcendental unity of apperception as the ordering possibility of the ground of all things was in no sense a declaration of, of, of the death of, of God, absolutely. But it was uh, a declaration of the, of, the, of the death of the taking for granted that we had answered the question of the unity of ground. The person, therefore, who brings that to the fore, who shows how it was done, didn't stop there, but rather showed that it, and he's, he says this. He says that Kant stared into the abyss, um, but was unable to make the final move. Because for Kant, the ordering, the ordering subjectivity of the subject means that the subject replaces God in the order of postulation. Now, when God postulates, God creates, as it were, to posit and to create, metaphysically speaking, we're always taken to be the same thing. You get this in Aquinas, that God is the creator of all things and the truth of all things resides in God's mind. Uh, uh, he, when Aquinas asks, both in the Summa Theology and in the um, Questionis Disputate de Veritate, the disputed questions on truth, uh, he asks whether truth is more in the uh, more in things than it's in the mind. He, re he responds, it's in the mind, but rather it is in the mind of God, because God is the author of all things. And Aquinas even goes so far as to say in the third question of the De Veritate, there are some things that God has thought of that he hasn't created, or rather he hasn't activated the existence of the things of which he has thought. This um, becomes postulated in the subjectivity of the subject, as the question of the grounding of the categories. Now, I could, we could talk actually not just for five minutes, but for five hours or even 50 on that question. But I want to make a jump, an, an absolute leap. And that's why I put this simple paragraph before you to show the radicality of, of what happens. Because I said earlier that the question is the postulation of the where or the when. When we postulate the ground as, this, as the beginning, in some sense, as the beginning of a series, we also tend to postulate it as an over there. 
as in the dim and distant origins of time? This is the question that Aaron and I were discussing with a good friend of ours in Cambridge, where what is the beginning of history, is our, our friend asks. And he says, well, in the end, you just have to decide. You make an arbitrary decision. You put a, a pin in the map of time and you say, well, I'm going to start history from here. Now, this was a question that beset, again, not Heidegger, but Husserl. Husserl asked himself, what orders ordering? Now, Kant's solution is that the subjectivity of the subject orders ordering. And again, we, it would take a long time to explain exactly why, but I'm hoping we can see instinctively that what orders ordering in Kant's solution is the will. That's why there's a straight line between Kant's, uh, uh, Kant's uh, metaphysics and Nietzsche's, which appear as the will to power. Because the, the will to power, or rather that everything appears as willed, which is the eternal return of the same, the thing that nobody could pass, nobody could understand. Even Karl Jaspers, who thought extensively about Nietzsche, said, of course, you know, the, the eternal return is the one bit of Nietzsche that nobody can really work out. He says this in his book on Nietzsche that appeared uh, just after the war. So it's a wonderful book, by the way. I mean, it has one of the most beautiful openings, I think, of any of the books written in that period. Uh, uh, um, a, a book written by a man with a Jewish wife writing from a, a position of understanding of the terrible position of the Holocaust and the place in which Nietzsche had been put in uh, the ideas around the Holocaust. That's, that's how important that book is. Jaspers dismisses this. But in fact, what we want to find is what is the ordering of order that is not willed, but that we cannot resist, that we cannot get out from under. In other words, what order of ordering in, so imposes on itself, uh, itself on us, and we so take for granted as ordering everything that orders, that as it were, it escapes our notice that it is doing the ordering that it is ordering. Husserl, in the, in the work of phenomenology, as it were, took this moment to be the present, or rather the presence of the present. This explains just this last sentence that I, uh, uh, in um, this little discussion of Aristotle, um, he, uh, where Heidegger says, from here on out, how the Greeks view being as properly in the present, being as dealt with in the mode of presentness becomes intelligible. Now, why is this important? Why would the presence of the present be the thing that orders ordering? The pre and you get this in, in this, this English translators struggle with the tra how to translate this because Heidegger says the moment that holds sway, in other words, that governs, that stands at the origin of order. This is what Heidegger means when he speaks of the inception of the um, Anfang, the, the Anfang, literally, that which, that which takes us into its grip. And uh, a, a, a finger is a hunter and in a, a septo is to capture, to seize. In septo, inception, unfungness, is that from which, who, from whose grip we cannot be freed. So you get how important this is. This is something in whose grip we stand, so much so that it actually escapes us that we're gripped. If we were able to bring out the presentness of the presence, as the ordering of all order, as what, as it were, lets into being all being. Now, there are huge problems here. There are questions. There are multiple, multiple questions. What happens here, for instance, with memory? What happens with records? What happens um, in a multiplicity of ways? And this can be, as it were, turned upside down. You end up with something like Foucault's history of the present. This is not that. This is absolutely not that. This is so subtle and yet so commandeering that it is not even the history of the present, but rather the presentness of the present even lets the ordering of the history of history, the history of historiography, if you like, come into the order that it is. So I'm not going to be able to answer this question 
in just the few minutes that I've given, I've probably already gone over. I, I can see Dr. Turner glazing over uh, as I speak and thinking he's got to shut up at some point. You'll notice that this passage begins with the question of the pathé. The pathé in Greek are what we call often the emotions. But, and then you will notice in the German that Heidegger uses this word Befindlichkeit, the, the infindments, literally, the befindments of being human. In a previous discussion earlier on in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle goes on at great lengths that the, that the, the pathé arise on the basis of something called the mesotes. The mesotes is what is often translated as the mean the half. Where did this half come from? And what does it mean? Not taken, Aristotle gives it a sort of, you know, th this is why people think that Aristotle is all about balance and about being in the middle and about, you know, being um, even handed and so on. It's not what's being referred to at all. This half, which Heidegger refers to as the insufficient, the in-between, in-between therefore what and what the insufficient, which is human life, the pathé, the befindlichkeiten, the dispositions that we have, all place us in midst. They place us in the midst of the presentness of the presence, but they place us also in the midst of a series that begins with our death, with our life, and ends with our death. And this in midst remains with us until the moment that we die. We are still in midst, in sufficient, in between, mesotis, en mesoi, right up until the moment of death. In other words, it's the experience of the timeliness of time itself. You should hear in that the presentness of the present. Who is the person who discussed this above all else, which isn't discussed in Aristotle here, but is referred to, he's implied by multiple terms because Aristotle says that this en meso, this mesotis, is one of the things that comes out of the sunehes. Now, anybody who's studied Parmenides knows that that sunehes, that being held together with, which is the continuous, so we're in the half of the continuous. And the person who played with this idea was Zeno. Zeno shows us that what lays hold of us in a way that also seizes us and grips us as a riddle that we have to resolve, but is nevertheless always en mesoi, in the half, halfway between life and death, halfway between earth and heaven, halfway between uh, death and deathlessness, the gods themselves, is, is the presentness of the present itself as that from which all other ordering, every other kind of ordering flows. Now I've just laid this out as a mere kernel, as a mere, as a mere thought, as a thought in a, a 15 minute uh, uh, solution to the question of grounds. But I will make only one promise to you, and that is that in any way that one tries to get out from under this notion of the presentness of the present, the immediacy of the immediate as the ground itself, the ordering of all ordering, ontologically taken, the meaning of being itself, if you want to be that dramatic, I will show you how your attempt to get out of it actually belongs to, to um, the presentness of the present and cannot be grounded in any other experience of being neither the experience of the future, nor the experience of the past, nor the experience of a beyond, nor the experience of an afterlife, nor the experience of a, of a, of a proto-life, as it were, if you want to describe some interpretations of, of Plato as something like that. But rather, when we hold to the presentness of the present, in fact, every philosophical thought stands before us as capable of being thought through and unlocked. I'll be that dramatic. I'll be that dramatic. The whole of philosophy now stands before us as potentially able to be opened on the basis of this thought, which is neither Husserl's nor Heidegger's, nor even Zeno's, which perhaps comes to us
from Parmenides, but because of something that Parmenides was able to see and assert with such clarity that it's caused confusion ever since it was asserted. In response to that, I mean, why was it Heidegger then who who was able to see that if this question opened up by Parmenides and maybe not before, if it was by Parmenides, why did it take until Heidegger to realise that this question has been obscured the whole time through, what, 2,500 years of Western thought? I, that's the mo I mean, that's a question that I pondered long and hard for a long time. And, uh, you know, and I think it is a, it's a fantastic question. It's the right question. You know, and, and Heidegger himself was aware of it. He actually says this at one time. He says we can only even begin to ask the questions of phenomenology because there is one. He doesn't name him, actually, but there is one, he says, who's written a book called Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, The Gay Science. And he's referring to Nietzsche. And of course, it's in Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft where Nietzsche first announces the death of God. You remember the, the famous passage, the madman. By the way, the madman with the lantern, which is taken from a trope of antiquity, of, a, of the madman who goes into the agora with a lantern in broad daylight. In, in other words, he's indicating that the beginning of the... the uh, in other words, we'd love to come up with a psychological reason. It was because Heidegger's IQ was so big or because he was he was such an egotist that, you know, only he could have had the, the sheer hubris to believe that he could solve every... No, it's not. It's simply that he... That two things happened, I think. One is that it was only around about the time of Heidegger that the question of the importance of the earliest Western thinkers was even aggregated. You know, you remember, I mean, Diels Kranz had been, Diels Kranz, or Diels Kranz hadn't even been published when Heidegger made that point about the gay science. It was simply Diels's, Diels's collection of the, 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 uh, the, the so-called pre-Socratic fragments had only come out a few years before. Karl Reinhardt's book on the importance of Parmenides had only come out in 1916. In other words, when Heidegger says that, you know, it's only at the end that we can see the importance of the beginning, he isn't making some clever, tendentious, logical point. He's reminding us that we've only begun to think about the beginning and look at what's left of it in terms of the fragmentary remaining of it. Now, the question is, you know, uh, the, a right question would be, well, why is it these Greeks? And again, we can't answer that in a soundbite in, in a discussion like this, but we can say, well, because that's a tradition of thinking this question through in which we stand. It does have a value because of that. It emerges in a particular way in Greece because of a set, a set of unique historical circumstances. So that Heidegger doesn't therefore become some superman, some ubermensch who's able to postulate all of this, but rather he is somebody who had accomplished something very unusual and remarkable, an accident of his education, an accident of his time, and an accident of what others had been thinking within his own living memory, I, Nietzsche, in fact, or uh, Husserl, Diltai, Rickert, these people in whom he was steeped right from the beginning, and Reinhardt, um, because he'd had a thoroughgoing uh, education in the question of grounds as it, was as it was thought through Christian metaphysically, because he'd had a Catholic education in Catholic Aristotelianism, um, because the Catholic Church had rediscovered its origins in a, uh, or its intellectual or origins in Aquinas, and Aquinas's retrieval of Aristotle, and the, the way in which Aquinas was standing on Jewish and Islamic shoulders in order to do that. In other words, there's the continuity all the way back to Greece, uh, Christian metaphysics, Jewish and Islamic metaphysics, and then what, what Nader and I were talking about last night, the, the even murkier period of what stands behind the Jewish and Islamic taking up of those, Islamic, uh, of those questions, and the way that they become fused with an understanding of a uh, of a monotheistic god. I mean, this is what this is what this tradition does. That monotheism provides the unity that the Greek understanding of the hen once had secured 
with Anaximander, with Parmenides, uh, and with Heraclitus. So the one might say rather that Heidegger was a pathé of the, a befindlichkeit, a happening of the moment, because the, the pathé are the things that befall us. There's a whole raft of stuff I would like to say about why the pathé are not incomplete, but rather they are completions of the moment. Because in you, when, I, when you read Aristotle's description of the pathé, the befindlichkeit, as, as Heidegger calls them, the, the dispositions, or I, I prefer to translate them as the affects. Those of, some of you may remember affect theory, which was all the rage in gender theory a few years ago. It gestured in this direction, but it understood one thing which is, as it were, we are a consequence of what befalls us. Aristotle describes the arete, the excellence, the, what we now translate as virtue, as the getting hold of what befalls you and bringing it out into its teleos, into its, into its end, into its, its fulfillment in the moment. He's still struggling, in other words, with Parmenides. He's relying on a Parmenidean understanding of the experience. In other words, he grounds this, not rationally like Leibniz did, or like the Christian metaphysicians did. He grounds it in the experience of being human. Now, Heidegger was also able to understand that. Volume, his, his discussions of Aristotle in the rhetoric and his discussions of the, uh, the basic principles of Aristotelian philosophy all grapple with this, but he was only able to see this because of the work that he had done with Husserl in trying to work out how the human being actually experiences the demand of the, the full, rich unity and totality of the demand of the momentariness of the moment, which is what Husserl had been obsessed with for 50 years before. That's how I would answer your question. In other words, Heidegger is no Ubermensch, but rather the other way around. The very moment at which it became possible for someone to bring all of this together, someone did. Someone who was quite messy and scrappy and, and brings with him his own problems that we have to see into and around. He himself is a consequence of his moment. That's why we have to understand his... Uh, his brief commitment to the Nazi party as well. I mean, that's, that's how we have to deal with it. Nobody has said this. They're far too busy pointing accusatory fingers to wonder how it is that something so remarkable happened. And actually, it's not just in one life, because as you and I have discovered, Aaron, Heidegger's in touch with a whole raft of people who are debating these questions and struggling with them all at the same time. In other words, it wasn't just Heidegger. He was the consequence of a, a most crucial and important conversation that was going on right across Germanic Europe at that moment, somewhere, let us say, compressed in the crucible of the period between the First and the Second World Wars. I think that was a, <clears throat> a really important point, though, because Heidegger, I mean, you know, he, I've never seen it written down, but he, he, he is a kind of accidental distillation of all these these um, strands of thought that have emerged through, I suppose, the 18th and 19th century and into the 20th century. So you've got the, the rise of Kantianism, the collapse of, uh, uh, of German idealism, the rise again of neo-Kantianism, and then the rise of positivism, logical positivism, the collapse of historicism. He's emerging out of all these kinds of... Um, you know, these these threads of, of Western thought through people like Diltai, Husserl, Ricker, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complete mishmash. And, and when we, so many people seem to make the error that when we look back on Heidegger and we look at the what, 102 volumes in the Gazantar Scarborough, 104, 102, and we think it's some big grand master plan. And then we start looking for inconsistencies there. So we say, well, in 1922, he said this. And then in 1934, he said this. Oh, but in 1956, he said this. But it's not, it's his struggle through that thinking, isn't it? It's how he how he comes against the thinking that has emerged over, well, since Parmenides, and how he tries to, to think through the ground of that thinking as an unfolding of thought itself yeah. um, until his time. And then, you know, it's why he grapples with different thinkers at different times, because he's working out how exactly thinking unfolds in the way that you described in your in your presentation. 
Th this is where I think there's a hugely important connection with what, David, you've been trying to think through in this question of tyranny, because the question that's beset me in this question of tyranny is did the Greeks recognize tyranny because they already understood freedom or did they derive an understanding of freedom out of their experience of tyranny? Something happens, in other words, in, in, in the Greek experience uh, very early on. You could say that it's crystallized in Athens in a particular way. But what, what, um, what shines out of the hero, what shines out of, Aes of uh, Aeschylus's The Persians, what shines out of that discussion that um, Aaron and I were looking at in Herodotus between Otanes and um, I can't remember the two other names of the two other Persians who were discussing the nature of democracy, is the tension between uh, tyranny and freedom. But the Greeks had secured an understanding of freedom, which also had a consequence in the shaping of the democracy. Now, we wouldn't say that that meant that Solon sat down or um, uh, Cleisthenes sat down with a blueprint for democracy, a constitution, in the same way that the, let's say, the founders of America did sit down with a blueprint for a democratic state, as it, uh, as it were. But nevertheless, they are struggling with something which moves in a certain direction. You know, Plutarch reports this lovely story about Solon where Solon's on his way to the, the Agora and, and somebody comes up to him and he says, oh, Solon, you know, you had the opportunity to become a tyrant in Athens and you didn't. Why did you pass up such a good opportunity? It's the other, it's the opposite version of the, the tale of the hero. You know, when Simonides is saying to uh, a hero, look, you know, tyranny is such fun because you get the best women, you get the best boys, you get the best palaces, you get the best horses, you get the best of everything. This guy was saying the same to Solon, and Solon says, tyranny is very sweet, kalos in Greek, in the Greek, uh, Plutarch's Greek. Tyranny is very sweet, is a very sweet place, he says, from which there is no way back. Solon had seen something about the character of tyranny uh, and its implacedness. It's both its sweetness and its entrapment that it seems to me Xenophon is also laying up. Now there you have that tension. Two different people, admittedly Solon is what, two, three hundred years before Xenophon, but still this debate is going on. This, this debate to bring out an explanation of a phenomenon that's come before them, before their very eyes, the possibility of the untying of the bonds. Plutarch, of course, writing three, four hundred years after Xenophon. Who knows if that story is real or whether it really had been remembered for 700 years or whether it's a really insightful insight. It's a story that isn't true but should have been about what could have been said between Solon and a mate of his on the way to the Agora. Who knows? And yet it's indicative of the, the shape of the debate that necessarily unfolds around these questions. I think we've solved the problem of Western philosophy and Western civilization there, Lawrence. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, on a Monday, on, for this Monday morning, in this present moment, uh, on this Monday morning at least, but not more than that. Let's, let's, not, let's not be victims of our own, or let me not be a victim of hubris. But it is, uh, I think it's got to have, um, to go to your favourite subject, I'm going to wind you up now and watch you go with a different subject, which would be Mackinder, because... What is it about Greece? Because, you know, I've read the, I've quite, you know, I've got a kind of amateur interest in Japanese kind of um, classical political philosophy, if you, you know, to call it, because it's not really philosophy, I couldn't, you can call it that book, kind of classical historiography. And if you read the early Japanese histories, it's very, um, there's no, um, none of these issues are discussed because it's, all of the history is dedicated to proving, as it were, that the imperial household is descended from the gods, right? So it just starts off with 
the gods who created Japan, and then they their line becomes the imperial line. And so all of like, Japanese kind of political philosophy from the early days surrounds justifying that that story, if you like, and seeing how that story plays out. So there's no sort of sense, there's no tradition of critique at all. Right? That concept just doesn't doesn't exist. And yet the Greeks had it. So why? It's, it's such a fascinating subject because, you know, I think having spent a lot of time in Japan, uh, I would say the Japanese are extraordinarily intelligent and thoughtful. <laughs> so it's not a question of, oh, there's some kind of genetic reason for it. That doesn't, it doesn't seem to be that, does it? But it seems to be some kind of unique circumstance which meant that the Greeks had this, I don't know what you call it, is it like a disposition really? So, but it's curious that that, that yeah, well, why should it be the, the hexes? Yeah, the I mean, I remember going to a conference in one of the first conferences I ever went to in Oxford in 2014, and it was on um, historical consciousness and um, historiography, but it was, it was an international um, spectrum. And, and it, it, that was the exact thought I, I arrived at. You know, there were, there were panels on Greek Roman historiography, but then they, they were all over, you know, Asia, Eastern Asia. Um, uh, the Middle East and places like that. And in every other, apart from Greece, no one else had this kind of concept of, of cause, even this, you know, where the Greeks developed this, this narrative where you see this chain of cause and effect going through, a, you know, a historical event. From what I could gather from uh, all the other kind of uh, cultural historiographies, they were simply chronicles. It was simply this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It, it didn't need that. The, the interlinking of the chain to say, well, why did this happen at this particular point? And it made me question then, why, again, that, that, that question, why Greece? Why did it happen for the Greeks that they that they could reflect on, as Lauren says in his paper, the ground of the ground, you know, the, the ordering of the order, or the ordering of the ordering of the order in, in, in another way. I mean, there are two things that one would want to say here, aren't there? The, one of them is that you, I, I remember when I was first being taught philosophy and we were, we, it was banged into us, the difference between contingency and necessity. And this notion of contingency and necessity was, in, was secured on entirely rational grounds. And yet in the Parmenidean fragments, there is an understanding of contingency and necessity, which doesn't re require rational grounds at all. Parmenides secures the necessity of, necessa the, uh, of the necessary in part as what just happens because you can't undo that which has occurred. And so therefore, you cannot necessarily predict that it would have occurred in that way. And you, you, you cannot say that it was necessary that it would happen. But in as much as it has happened, it has necessarily happened in that way. And so he secures it Parmenides secures it historically in its place, let's say place rather than history, in its place time, the timidness. So that's the first thing that, that needs to be understood, that necessity is not, a, is not a rational or rationally predictable thing. It's why economists can't predict crashes, because in fact, the, rest, the, the rational doesn't predict the necessary. It can do. I mean, there are some, you can say, that if you join that wire with that wire, you will blow that thing up. But often in more complex things, we don't have that. We don't have that rational security. And in fact, that rational security is often only secured on the notion, on the understanding of the past. Because we have made the bomb in that way in every case. And when we've put that wire with that wire, it therefore blows up the bomb. Then we know that it's necessarily true, but, or almost certain to be, almost certain to be necessarily true, because some part of the bomb may fail. But when you connect the wires, it will explode. So we, we try to account for necessity in that way. But the necessary is what has actually happened. But the other thing is that what, and this is a, David's allusion to Mackinder, the, the, his explanation of the way in which what we, well, something much wider than what we now call Europe emerged, this basin of happening, which began, in fact, with the Alexandrians, with the Phoenicians, um, uh, uh, and so on, is a consequence of the shape of the earth itself of the shape of the earth and the numbers of the people moving on it. 
you know, he says this. He says, he says Europe is a consequence of the move, movement of peoples in Asia across 21 million square miles of land. And by that he means what others and others have said this. It wasn't unique, in, by far from unique in saying this. Uh, 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 historical anthropology has, has argued this over and over again, sometimes with reference to him, but sometimes proving it entirely independently of him. That movements of peoples from as far away as the Pacific seaboard and, and limited by the desert to the south and by the ice limits to the north and the shape of the earth and the shape of the climate in certain places on the steppe and so forth, almost inevitably led to the condensation once human numbers reached certain levels, the condensations of certain kinds of of civilization in some places and not in others. I mean, you, Beckwith has, has raised this. He links the collapse of the Central Asian civilizations with the way in which the, the pressure from the West, the pushback from the West, ceases when the West goes out into what we uh, uh, call the New World, which is not a New World at all. It's only a New World for those who discovered it to be so. But as it were, this. This releases the pressure that created those civilizations above where Lasha is, above um, above the Caucasus, and above um, uh, in that landmass of the steppe across the top of the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. I mean that, that that's it's a, it's a fascinating understanding of, as it were, the the necessities that arise out of the shape of the natural phenomenon that is the earth. This is a far different understanding from securing the shape of the earth, as it were, economically through spreadsheets, which is what we're doing now, through trade agreements and constitutions, which is how we think of it now. This unfolding that, that took place, as it were, we say naturally, because it's not, the, the natural appears to account for this. But this is no, this is, this is no more natural than a spreadsheet is natural it's but rather it is a the unfolding of a phenomenon in a particular way which we can then we can relearn and recover the meaning of which suggests therefore that greece is not an arbitrary moment it is not the placing of a pin on a timeline or in the map in some arbitrary way but it occurs now why Greece over and above the Akkadian civilization, for instance, or the Egyptian, these magnificent civilizations that arose. You know, McNeil, whose history of the world, talks about the three great civilizations of this movement, not just Europe, but India and China. Now, then again, there is the question of why why thinking emerges in the way it does, a particular kind of thinking that emerges as it does in the history that is inaugurated with the Greeks. There's an awful lot that could be said there. Why, for instance, it's a question you and I have been pondering. Why does the word for, there are several words for truth in ancient Greek. Why does aletheia privilege itself over etimos or over on, enai, itself? Why? And yet it does. And it's crucial, it seems to me, uh, uh, what's crucial in this is, the, the, is because Alithea is involved in contestation. Something is drawn out of something rather than just taken to be. Alithea is a drawing out from, uh, from hiddenness. But as Heidegger insists, this hiddenness is not hiddenness that is total darkness, but rather the presence of what is present has to be brought out into its meaning by human being. That's Alithea. It's not, um, uh, it's not a creation ab initio or ex nihilo, as Kant has it. Kant, for Kant, all meaning is ex nihilo. That's why the will to power, and that's why the eternal return of the same works. The eternal return of the same is the notion of the creatio ex nihilo, but transferred to human knowledge to human erkenntnis theory, theory, that in each case I recreate the world anew from the categories in my head or in the subjectivity of my subject. This is not true. The world is already there in advance of me. I'm not constantly recreating the world. 
the world is already there. I bring it to presence and I can bring it to presence badly or well. This is, there's your notion of arete. Arete is constant preparedness to bring out the presencing of the world in, a, in, in the best possible way. Now, if you read Aristotle on the connection between the mesotes, that being in the midst, and arete, what we now translate as virtue, excellence, the acrotes, the highest, he says that the mesotes is the, the mesotes is the pathé, not the arete. See, we think of being the best, that's the excellent, uh, that's the excellent moment. But in fact, even being bored is a total fulfillment of the mind, and as long as you're bored, or feeling ennui, or being lost, this is a completeness. All this is, is a, a reference to Parmenides' understanding that being, um, uh, being is full of being. Even when you feel exhausted and elevated and, and empty and unable to do anything, this is a pleroma, it's a fullness. It's the totality of who you are at that moment. Now, touching on, on David's reference to the Japanese gods, again, there's, there's, there's much that could be said about the question of the aie. Of, oh no, we always translate that as eternal. But for Greek, for the Greeks, the aie is, the, is the, um, the electric presencing of the momentary in so far as it goes on being a moment. If you're a god, that going on being a moment is, is, has no beginning and no end. It's a thanatos. It's without death, without end. Whereas if you're a human, you think of Pindar, epameroi, creatures of a day, he says, in that last strophe of the, uh, it's the, the sixth Pythian, isn't it? Creatures of a day. The day is the ion, very often, of, an, of everyday life, not total life, not our birth and our death, but we tend to take one day at a time, especially, in other words, each of these is a fullness, it's a completeness. I'm aware that we are, we have two minutes to go, so I... Yeah, I have to go, unfortunately, um, yeah. so thing. Just one little curio for you though, uh, Lawrence, I'll give you a little lesson in Japanese philology. So the Japanese word for truth, so honto is, so hon means the roots and to means like um, sort of exposure or, um, you know, kind of revelation, so revealing the roots. So that's literally the word that, that that's how you that's get to the truth in Japanese. So, yeah, it's not just the uh, um, Greek philologists who <laughs> have an interest in these issues, but that obviously comes from China, like they're using the Chinese characters, so I assume that in Chinese it's a similar a similar uh, thing. So your hon to is what's real. So that's exposing the roots. If you want to say a fact or kind of what's actually true, it's honjitsu, which means the actuality of the roots. So um, yeah, rootedness is the you know you can just see it in the in the text itself. You can see it in the language. Um, but I'll leave you to to. Um, well, there's a there's a conference waiting to happen. Isn't yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's literally root. It's the same word that you'd use for the roots of a tree. Right. You're exposing the roots. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, bye bye on that note. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you later. I've got a good dash uh, Just Thanks. just one last comment, um, you know, because I have to go regrettably. How can we translate this into some kind of a um, I wouldn't call it methodology, but a kind of conceptual um, you know framework that will guide the various strands of the projects. I think we need to move to that level of uh, engagement. Not now, evidently, but... Um, the, that's an there are, yeah, that's there an are lots of elements there that would allow us in any way to bring this to bear on our work. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so a great thought, maybe right? next time we should uh, just yeah. dedicate it to discussions along these lines. Um, um, kind of constellation of methods, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Right. Nice
Thank you as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You still there? I've got to see if I can turn off the record. Stop recording. <clears throat> that that would be the one. Stop. Well, when you send it over, I can snip.